from Chicago's Can TV. A look at the week's events is reported in the newspapers, in the blogs and online, and on radio and TV. This is Chicago Newsroom. Hi there. Welcome to Chicago Newsroom. I'm Ken Davis. All right, let's go back to the law books once again, shall we, and recite it all together. Article 8, Section 5, membership in any pension retirement system of the state, any unit of local government or school district, any agency or instrumentality thereof shall be an enforceable contractual relationship, the benefits of which shall not be diminished or impaired, right? We've heard it all, we've heard it all before. We've been arguing about that since probably the day it was written. It's kind of like Illinois' own Second Amendment, you know, we'll just always argue about what those words mean. But we heard argument yesterday at the Illinois Supreme Court and it sounded a lot to people who were there as though the justices were skeptical of the state's argument that it could invoke police powers to override those constitutional provisions. So what does it mean if the court does stand by section five and says we Illinoisans have to pay up to fund all those pension obligations that our elected representatives have simply ignored to fund for years and years. And how does all of this affect the big question, the mayor's race? Because that's the focus of our show today, the mayor's race in Chicago and the fiscal cliff. Our friend Kate Grossman is here. Kate, good to have you back again. She's the editorial, uh, deputy editorial page editor at the Chicago Sun-Times. And they've been hammering these candidates to get serious about the fiscal cliff that we're dangling off of, fiscally speaking. And Ralph Martir is back again. Ralph, it's good to have you back on the show. Uh, he's from the Center for Tax and Budget Accountability. And I have to say that, Ralph, when you were here a year ago, it was last March when you were here, you made one of the most intriguing arguments I've ever really heard that our tax structure Illinois in here in Illinois is grossly unfair and that we don't have the ability to raise the revenue we need to just pay for the in incrementally growing costs of government. So we're going to try to, again, as I said, peer over the edge of that fiscal cliff today and try to ascertain for ourselves how deep is it, how far down is it, and if we do fall down, could we possibly pick ourselves back up and dust ourselves off and carry on, or will we, will we die at the bottom of the fiscal cliff? And of course, the real question is, what do Chewy Garcia and uh, Rahm Emanuel have to do with all of this? So let's first of all get your reaction to what happened yesterday in Springfield, both of you. I mean, it was, it was, a, it was a pretty pointed questioning as far as I could see. The, the justices seem to be tipping their hands that they're going to say that the, uh, that the law is unconstitutional, which means that they'd be siding with the unions. Is that, is that a fair assessment? Well, there was one justice in particular, uh, Thomas, who mm -hmm. asked very pointed questions, clearly showing his hand in favor of the union position that the the, the pension clause, as it's known, it is absolute. That you there's no exceptions, mm -hmm. and particularly no exceptions for fiscal crisis. He argued that is of the state's own making. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, there's real power in that argument. Yeah. Um, but um, I don't know. You know, he was the main questioner. Um, two other justices asked questions. M one was also fairly pointed. The others remained silent, so I don't know. I think it's. I think you, you at your own peril, you kind of <laughs> try to Good read point. into. Yeah. Although obviously, if there were justices that supported the state's position that you can amend these contracts, they might have said something to suggest they might, they might that. Might have asked a, an easy softball right. question. I mean, I or think something. I think the read. I had the same read that this is didn't look good mm -hmm. <laughs> for the state, um, mm -hmm. but I'm not sure really ha how to. Ralph, you're, you're yeah. nonpartisan. It but may not look good for the this? state, but it looks good for constitutional law. And I don't, I wouldn't characterize it, frankly, as the union position. I would characterize it as the legally mandated position to take. You, the first rule of legal construction of a constitution or, or a statute is there's no need to construe anything if the language is clear and unambiguous on its face. Well, that's pretty clear and unambiguous language. In fact, there's only three states with language this clear and unambiguous. And all three of these states have consistently ruled in their Supreme Court precedent that the right is absolute and inviolate consistently. Then if you did want to try to find some gray area, so there are lawyers in this world, so let's assume they're trying to find gray area, you look first at the constitutional history. 
The gentleman who drafted this clause said the reason we are putting this in the Illinois Constitution is to stop a practice by state or local governments of intentionally underfunding their pensions and then claiming the hole got so big they now are going to not pay off the benefits. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's the reason mm -hmm. for the clause, and it's in the express constitutional history. So what has happened here? Well. Historically, the state has made the intentional policy decision to not make the normal cost contribution. Mm. It intentionally grew its unfunded liability. In fact, the responsible funding bill that it passed in 1995, which we all talk about as the pension ramp, in 1995, our unfunded liability was $17 billion. By law, they grew it to $48 billion in 2008. That was the law. And they still grew it. They still continued to underfund it through 2012. That's mm -hmm. the first year that it was required to fully pay. So this is clearly a problem created by intentional policy decisions of the state. And it would be utterly irresponsible of the Supreme Court to rule any way other than, hey, we're going to enforce the Constitution. You had options, and you chose to create well, this problem. Well, but the argument was, uh, as I understand it, the argument was, we are in an emergency and because it's an emergency the state has police powers and our police powers will be to suspend that piece they, of they, the they don't so for the police powers to apply and this goes to u.s constitutional law the event creating the crisis had to have been unforeseeable at the time the contract was entered into the problem can't merely be a worsening of a condition that existed at the time the pensions were unfunded they've mm -hmm. been unfunded for a long period of time and it's merely a worsening of that condition. It doesn't even fall under the exemption that would permit a state to utilize its police powers as recognized by the U.S. Supreme Court. So it, it just doesn't. I mean, and, and that's very clear. And, and, you know, number two, if you're going to allow the state to do this for pensions, why not let it do it for bonds? Why not let it do it for contracts entered into well, by third-party contractors? That's the argument that the justice was raising yesterday. Basically, you opened the barn door and now. But I don't... It's not, and I think the Solicitor General made this point, like willy-nilly the state is not, if they, if they get this, if they win, it's not easy to amend a contract. They are still contracts by law. And you set a precedent and it does open the door to some respect, but I, I don't know, I don't, I don't see a flood of amended contracts coming it, after it, this. It would, it would be a horrible precedent. If you have, if you have a constitutional protection that a state could evade, by simply making intentional policy decisions to not make an appropriate investment, you're, you're really creating a Pandora's box. I mean, why, why have a constitution? What, what's the point of constitutional rights if they're not actually enforceable? And frankly, I, I don't know of any legal principle that would allow such an interpretation. And we, you know, my organization, we called when this bill was passed that it was gonna be ruled unconstitutional. It got ruled unconstitutional at the trial court level. We're very confident it's going to get ruled unconstitutional. Now, in fact, the only arguments we heard for why it might be ruled to be okay or is, well, this is Illinois, so, you know, they might ignore all these fine things like constitutional <laughs> rules. Okay, I'll give them the Illinois exemption. But other it than... after all, but, the Illinois right, Constitution. But, but uh, uh, other than this being <laughs> Illinois uh, mm. and hence everything being subject to political chicanery, uh, there's, there's really no rational basis to assume okay, that this law so, is constitutional. So our reason for calling you to the table here today is to see if there's any way that we can apply this discussion to the thing that's before us today, which is this impending mayoral election. We are, we are seeing your paper and, and the Tribune, uh, I, I think it's fair to say, uh, fairly pointedly informing us that we have to stay with Rahm Emanuel because he's the guy who knows how to fix this problem and has demonstrated the ability to do it. And it is certainly the conventional wisdom out there that until perhaps tomorrow when Chuy Garcia comes out with some kind of economic plan. He has no plan, and so therefore you have a guy who has a plan and a guy who doesn't have a plan. I think that's a reasonable way of describing yeah. your position and, and the Tribune's position. So what happens, well, I mean, there's several things I want to I want to investigate. First of all, really, really, does Rahm Emanuel have a plan? I mean, does he have one? Well. I, Emmanuel hasn't articulated a plan the same reason Chewy Garcia hasn't because they're in the middle of election. Because they wouldn't get elected. Right. And who wants a property tax increase? Who wants to say cut the firefighters benefits? Nobody wants to say that. 
so granted, they're both guilty of it, though I, you know, we've argued that Garcia is far more guilty of it than Emmanuel is, in particular because Emmanuel has a record. You know, Emmanuel pushed through a reform of the municipal employees and laborers' pension funds, which cuts pensions and increases revenue for those funds. He did it. It's clear that's his model for how you do it. This and he was able to do that in, the, that, that's his own business. He could do that within the city. Well, no, it, the, it had to pass the state legislature. Oh, I guess so I every, missed that. I'm yeah, sorry. every, yeah. But which it did, is wh right? right, which is why, to your point right. about the I'm Supreme sorry, yeah. Court, is so relevant for everything because whatever the Supreme Court decides regarding the state pensions is relevant for Chicago pensions, mm -hmm. right. all right. the municipalities right. around the state. So when you look at Emanuel's track record, his blueprint is clear. He doesn't want to own it at the moment, and it's hard to blame him for it because he's running for re-election. But that, he, that's his blueprint, and he also was explicit when this passed cutting municipal laborers, municipal employees and laborers, that he wanted to fund it with property ta with a pro property tax increase. Now mm -hmm. he, he he pulled back because there was a lot of resistance. Mm -hmm. But you know I've talked many times to their budget people. This is clearly the the only revenue source that they think is reliable, stable, and deep enough to mm -hmm. to to tap into that they can count on to make a dent in the pension payments. So in some, basically, they've both been very vague. Chewy has been more vague, but we know basically where Emmanuel stands on this. If Garcia comes out tomorrow and says uh, essentially the same thing, that we're going to have to do this and this, and that there's at least some vague reference to the fact that they're going to have to bring in more revenue at some point, does that make him more attractive as a candidate at this point? Um, well, first of all, we're we're way past the time of vague. You know, mm -hmm. this is 2015 is the year. We're mm -hmm. in it. We we have a $300 $300 million operating deficit for the city. A $550 million pension bill that's due uh, an extra $550 million for police and fire plus another at least another $50 million that needs to go for these mm -hmm. other two pension funds. Anyway, this we're we're here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we we mm -hmm. we don't have time. There's no place now for vague statements and we've so unless Garcia comes up with something very concrete that's actionable, um, I know there's, yeah. there's no room anymore. Yeah. I think it's true that, you know, Rahm's been mayor, so he's had to actually take some actions to deal with the fiscal problems that have confronted the city, and they're very real and they're very significant. The issue with Rahm's approach is it bet too much on hoping that pension benefits would be something you can cut. Without that piece, there's really some very significant issues with Rahm's approach. And this is not to get to anything on, everything you said about what Chewy's put on the table the far is accurate. There's not a lot to analyze there. But Rahm, for instance, it, the city of Chicago. Yeah, that must, excuse me, that must be frustrating for you as a, as a nonpartisan budget analysis group. Yeah. That there's it's, just, it's, it's like, if, well, if, we, if, we yeah, can't we, find anything if, to analyze. If you here. can't analyze it, you can't <laughs> analyze it. And we, we had that frustration in the last gubernatorial <laughs> election with the right. candidate rounders mm -hmm. position. So there you go. <laughs> but here, look at what Rahm and the past mayor of Chicago have done since 2010 they've known that this pension ramp was coming up since 2010. No one's prepared for it. Mm -hmm. By the state law that created this pension ramp, and by the way, gave them some pension holidays, pre-pension yeah, ramp, so yeah. this kick up is something that they bartered for, they have to budget fully for this payment when it becomes due and level up, levy, excuse me, appropriately for it in their property taxes. Rahm hasn't levied for it in the property taxes, and he hasn't budgeted for it. So the, Rahm Emanuel's budget actually doesn't comply with state law. Hmm. There's a big missing piece here, a $550 million piece. And no one's explaining why the city could go around and budget in a way that appears to be mm -hmm. completely contrary to the requirements of state law, mm -hmm. and why a sitting mayor doesn't have an answer for this issue when that sitting mayor has been there and known about it since he's been in office is another question. Right. Although to be fair, I mean, the, since 2010 we've known this cliff, this $550 million cliff is coming, but arguably reforming the municipal employees and laborers funds was step one. There's four, there's four city funds and you're supposed, you know, 
So it's not as if he's been it, sitting around twiddling it, it, his thumbs. But, but, it's, but, it, but that gets to the core of the point. It's only arguable if you want to ignore the language of the Constitution. I mean, here's where it frustrates us as outside good government people. We couldn't find an independent expert that's truly independent, not funded by either side yeah. or whatever, whatever, that had any reading of the Constitution other than you can't cut these benefits. We couldn't find a one. Our analysis was the same. All legal precedent at the Supreme Court level in Illinois was the same. Our constitutional provision was predicated on New York State's constitution. Like I say, us, Arizona, and New York State are the only states that have this very strong protection. All precedent in New York State is consistent with you can't cut these benefits. All of right. it. Well, so, 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 what, you know, so what politicians did was continue to kick the can forward. They, they, they passed something they knew probably wouldn't be constitution. They knew that when they passed it to just kick the ball out and maybe get it through another election campaign or whatever. And, and that is not an approach to public policy that's okay. And, and frankly, deferring to the courts to determine policy decisions that ought to be made by a chief executive officer, be it a governor or mayor, and a general assembly or other legislative body like the city council, is irresponsible. And, and that's been our frustration. We've said you're not dealing with this rationally, you're not actually taking on the problem, you are kicking it down the road, and you're throwing out this empty hope that a court will uphold something that's clearly unconstitutional. Well, so face. what's the solution? Because you know the, the, the paradigm that Emanuel has put forth is a mix of pension reductions and new revenue. So if there's no pension reductions, it's, either, it's all new revenue cuts or efficiencies, whatever. W there's what, a third. What, there's a what, third. What's the third? The third is reamortizing your pension debt in a rational way. And if they don't do that, if they continue to have these backloaded pension repayment plans where the amount that you have to kick in increases significantly every year, it won't ever be made. Because if you think about it, the same tax dollars that fund the pension obligation are the tax dollars that fund current services. So the competition at the city right, level is fierce. is fierce, right? Police and fire and streets and sands or put in your pension. So if you don't have a rational, affordable levy, level payment for your pension plan, you encourage politicians to jump through all these hoops to avoid it or kick it off or get another pension holiday or whatever. Now at the state level actually, even though this, the amount of the unfunded liability is significantly greater, a re to a level dollar can get the systems fully funded, 100% funded in 43 years, not 30. But in 30 years, they'd be 78% funded and you're healthy at 80. So they'd be getting there and it would take a ton of pressure off the system. Chicago's in a worse condition because their funded ratio is significantly lower. And the amount of money that the city of Chicago would have to put in is going to be pretty close to this $500 million figure, but on a flat amount and extended out for a longer period. So you're going to need significant new revenue, and that's not just going to come from the property right, tax. Talk to me in English now, okay? Re uh, re amortization. Refinance. It's, it's the like, same thing like as refinancing refinance. your mortgage, right. right? Okay. So you would take a bunch of money and you would put it in up front, and it would. N no, you, no, you wouldn't put in a bunch of money up front. You would get to, so you'd say, all right. With a pension system, it's unlike a, a traditional debt in that a traditional debt, you borrow money and you owe that amount of money that you have to pay back over a certain period yeah, of time. Yeah. With a pension system, when you've borrowed money, you not only owe that back to the system, but the system itself has ongoing payment obligations that grow over time to retirees, both current and future. So you have to come up with a payment structure that recognizes those cash flow challenges that confront pension systems. In other words, you have to have something that grows the funded ratio, pays back your debt, gets you to a point where the systems is health, are healthy, and permits the systems to make all those current payments for retirees. We've, we've run the numbers, like I said, at the state level, and we know we could do it there. We are running the numbers at the city level, and the number, frankly, is a more challenging number for the city, which then gets to, all right, you get, a, you get a number that if you hit it and you level it out for a certain number of years, you'll get to where you need to go city doesn't have enough revenue to hit it. Right. So that's, that gets that's to the, the revenue right, side of the ledger. That's the point. I mean, whether you take Ralph's view or Emmanuel's view, which I'm you know, speaking about, you've got to come up with more revenue, particularly in the city. And that's so whether it's this high or this high, there's, you've got to jump. Yeah. And, and, and also, you know, I don't know what Garcia is going to say with the finance plan, but as far up till now, he's been opposed to most new revenue mm -hmm. ideas. Mm -hmm. So, and I honestly, I don't think 
the, the TIF funds, which I think are likely to prom, you know, figure prominently as planned, mm -hmm. there is money to be had there, but nowhere near the magnitude of what we're talking about. I think that's been fairly well demonstrated. Right. Yeah. So and certainly not to your point, which is that sustainability. I mean, you could get a one-time bump uh, from yeah. taking TIF revenue, but right. then the growth mm -hmm. thereafter, even the amount, the dollar will be less and smaller. Mm -hmm. Right. So. Mm -hmm. I don't know what he's going to come up with, um, but you know we've looked at a lot of the revenue ideas that have been tossed around: this LaSalle Street tax mm -hmm. on traders, a mm -hmm. commuter tax, mm -hmm. a city income tax. Um, you know there may be merit in some of them. I I think any if you do any of them um, on a grand scale, there are serious negative consequences particularly the LaSalle Street tax and probably the commuter tax. And they require state law, don't they? Right. Yeah. State, yeah. I think one thing that both the state, number one, needs to do for its fiscal system and would be incredibly helpful for all local governments, not just the city of Chicago's expansion of the state sales tax base to include consumer services. Mm -hmm. And like I say, you don't want to go Warner after all services. He said he favors that. Well, sort of. he says he sort favors of. an expansion of the base to include services, but mm -hmm. he includes a lot of businesses and professional services, and frankly, that's not what you want to tax. Mm -hmm. That ends up, in some cases, double taxation, trip triple mm -hmm. taxation. Mm -hmm. In fact, a few years ago when Rod Blagojevich recommended a gross receipts tax, which is a broad tax on the entire service industry, business to business et cetera, we testified against it. It's horrible tax policy. Mm -hmm. But if you isolated out consumer services, just consumer services, that would mean $2.4 in new revenue for the state annually that mm -hmm. would grow and about $300 million and change more for the city of Chicago or at least eliminate its current imbalance. Just that one maneuver. Mm -hmm. Then an adjustment to the property tax for the city going back to uh, the 5% rate on the income tax and allowing local governments to share fully in the local government distributive fund. Do you have a different governor than I do? <laughs> no, I mean, you know, we have a governor that puts some very interesting challenges on local governments in his budget speech if he were to get his way, but I don't know that he's going to get his way. He does have to convince a democratically controlled House and Senate, and I don't, I don't see a lot of appetite there. Uh, but I tell you what, the governor we do have, as you pointed out, Ken, did say he would support an expansion of the sales tax base to include yeah. services. Now that you could argue yeah. over what that would be, but that's at least something that could be part of a grand bargain. You reamortize the pension debt, and then at least at the state level, you could solve all your fiscal problems with those two steps and one more thing, taxing some retirement income, and that's not controversial at all. No, but I, but <laughs> no, if, no, but no. If everyone's you would, for that. But if you would do that, and you could do it in a very rational way, I know the Civic Federation has a very similar recommendation to ours, which is, you would allow the full exemption to continue to be in play for individuals with 50000 a year or less in adjusted gross income. So literally, you wouldn't go after fixed income seniors, low income seniors, et cetera. And then you phase out the full exemption over a period of time so people wouldn't be paying income taxes on all of their retirement income until their AGI was over $150,000. At the state level, that generates $1.2 billion, and it affects very few seniors. So it's, it's a lot of money, and once again, the local government share is not insignificant on that. So there are ways to get to sound tax policy at the state level that would really be beneficial for local governments that I don't think run afoul of anything Rauner has said publicly. Rauner has never yeah. said, you, you got to keep all retirement income out of the income tax base. That's a base issue that's a that's a pure tax policy issue he has said he'd support an expansion of sales tax base and there can be no rational reason against refinancing your pension debt well I think that um, there are several issues that, that you've raised that are are, are state-based and, and of course a lot of what we're talking about here is, is the city but I do want to mention that you, we don't have time to go into them but just people who want to go to the CTBA website and read these as I have uh, your study about how millionaires don't actually run away from big cities like Chicago when you increase their taxes a little bit right. because they really don't want to live in um, Indianapolis they'd rather live here uh, and and that um, half of that we, we all know that the, the income tax Taxes were reduced uh, starting January 1st by whatever it was, a third or so. And that your study of that has shown that half of that reduction, the benefits of half of that reduction went to the top 11% of, of wage earners in, in Illinois. Right. So it really, it really had no, it, it not only 
put us in t further into the hole, but it just simply really benefited people who didn't need the benefit. And it's not just a matter of class warfare. It's because those are the people who don't need to have their taxes cut because they don't put that money back in. They don't go out and buy right. TVs it doesn't and stimulate VCRs. Consumer they already spending, have right. everything. It's, it's not going to be effective yeah. economic stimulus from fiscal policy. So, I mean, what we're, what we're really dealing with here is, is years and years and years of just kind of crazy tax policy. And it, and it and when you take into account also the fact that uh, politicians are chicken because they're always looking at the next election and they're not going to they're not going to tax us to to pay for the things that they're supposed to pay for uh, we get into a uh, well, we, so okay, we but, come but to the edge really of the really good cliff. point that's a really good point on the pension underfunding what the general public doesn't really know but i think they need to because it makes the whole discussion seem somewhat different is that the underfunding of the pension if you look at it a different way the pension systems actually subsidize the delivery cost of current services for decades. Mm -hmm. and, and it was pension money. Money should have right. gone to pension that yeah. instead went to housing yeah. or yeah. health care yeah. or yeah. whatever. And taxpayers never had to pay the full, full bill right. for the services they consumed. Now we owe debt. And if we'd owed this debt to a bank, we wouldn't be talking about trying to get out of paying the debt to the bank. We'd find a way to pay the bank yeah. where we can right. make but the Ralph, payments. You, you made an important point, which is that I completely agree. You know, we've been taking money from here to pay here. Because for, for many reasons, people have been unwilling. All these, you know, wonderful, rational solutions you talk about, they, they don't get implemented. And I, I agree with a lot of them. I just, the, the reason we're at the situation we are now is not, you know, there's some, you know, malfeasance here, but mostly it's because there was never enough money to do all the things that we mm -hmm. promised this mm -hmm. for the city and the state. You know, we want good pensions for people. We want good public schools. We want roads. We want all these things. And so we promised them all and we don't have enough money to pay for them. And, and, you know, the, the issue is that we really are at the cliff right now. And, you know, we should definitely expand the sales tax base. We should have a progressive income tax, but these things are not gonna happen this year. And what do we do right now? What, do you, what was your take on the Kerry Austin uh, thing? You, you, you guys yeah. had some great coverage of that where, where the budget, no, no less than the alderman who's the head of the budget committee, is standing there brought in to bash Chewy Garcia mm -hmm. and then just, I think, accidentally said, oh, yeah, well, we're going to have to raise taxes. And that set uh, the mayor <laughs> off a little bit. But, I mean, was that... I'm always interested in what goes on the behind old the old vaudeville scene. hook yeah. was right, right. out from the back. Was that something they did just because they had to get it out there and they didn't want the mayor to have yeah. to say you it? You know, I don't, I don't know if there was some behind the scenes plan. I mean, I appreciated her candor. Mm -hmm. Obviously, it didn't look like Emmanuel appreciated <laughs> her candor. But this is when you talk to aldermen yeah. who yeah. actually look at the numbers, yeah. this they is what it. they say. They know. Yeah. They're, they're yeah. not. Well, yeah. well, and Kate, to your point, so. This is going to have to be very uh, short. We're yeah, no, time. At, at some juncture, they do have to deal with the tax policy. And and Rahm Emanuel's famous for saying, waste no crisis. Well, right. well here's a crisis. Here's a crisis, and a it's legitimate, and yeah. it's state and local. And you have a bipartisan, maybe, chance to put together a bar grand bargain and at least deal with some of these structural tax issues. And so I think there's a moment where it is possible. That's a great place to end right there. We like to end on optimism, so. <laughs> We'll <laughs> grasp at whatever straws we'll, we'll can find. Whatever Notice whatever I didn't say get. problem. <laughs> <laughs> Kate Grossman from the Chicago Sun-Times editorial board, thank you so much. Thanks for being with us again. And Ralph Martier from the Center for Tax and Budget Accountability. Accountability, that CTBA. Go to CTBA website, you'll, you'll like it. And you can watch us anytime you want right here on Chicago Newsroom. And we're going to have another show that you'll be able to see at another time. On You can go to the same place. You can see our second show today. We're going to talk about aldermen in four of the wards that are up for, uh, up for election. I'm Ken Davis. We'll see you back here again next week. Thank you very much for watching CAN TV and for watching Chicago Newsroom. Bye for now.